So this is a, um, I, I put up sort of four topics as, you know, get something up on the wall. I hadn't quite expected to get quite so many votes for this one. So <laughs> now I have to talk about it. Um, I, the observation that drives it is that three things have happened in the last 12 months that, uh, that make a, represent, to my mind, a larger amount of progress in space travel than has happened in the last 40 years. Um, and so I, I, it's sort of interesting now to look at what these things mean and, and discuss the context. So that's more the, the point. I haven't got a any sort of presentation prepared. Oh, if someone should do some live Googling. Um, so the three are, firstly, the Falcon 9 uh, successful uh, landing. So this is something that um, Elon Musk's point is that to enlarge space travel, at least as a profitable venture rather than as a um, a sort of nation-state conflict one, which is what's happening in the 60s, the costs have to come down drastically. And so the problem right now is you're looking at a 30 to $35 million launch for um, a Energia launch. That'll get you 10 tons, I think, of, of payload into, the, into orbit, but it's still a very large amount of money, and it's a non-reusable vehicle. Uh, Musk's example is if the wooden ships of the 18th century and the 17th century were not reusable, if they were a one-way, uh, or even a two, you know, there and back again, and, and then throw it away, the United States wouldn't exist. The, the getting the costs of the, the vehicles down is so important that it, it drastically changes the outcome. We can't prove that the US wouldn't exist, but it seems a reasonable claim that if you're having to incur the cost of a ship for each voyage and not get it back, the way financing worked, you had to put up the cash, but you got it back at the, or most of it back at the, at the end. If you were bottomry, it's the, Financing mechanism. But if you were having to replace the ship every voyage, then the cost would have just stopped all of the European colonial project from occurring. Uh, maybe the world would be a better place, but importantly, the US wouldn't exist. So Musk has been working on a reusable vehicle that actually really is relatively cheap. The space shuttle was, a, was an attempt, but the space shuttle had about a $30 million, I forget which year, I think it's year 2000 are the numbers I'm quoting, about a $30 million um, sort of mission per, per launch cost, and could only li lift about a third of what an inertia, an, an inertia or Saturn V. Hello. Question. Uh, do you know the breakdown between the shell versus the fuel for, for rocket? Uh, for <coughs> the, the cost of fuel versus the just the engine. Do you mean the space shuttle, the Azure, or the Falcon? Even for, for the Falcon. Um, I mean, 90% of it is going to burn down. Yeah. So in the space shuttle case, the problem is just that they were having to rebuild the entire vehicle. So you've got a vehicle that's expensive to build, and they're having to rebuild it. Yeah, how far down can you get? Don't know. Uh, the, even the Falcon 9 suggests that you can do significantly better than even an inertia uh, with what uh, SpaceX is already doing with their f even their first launch, let alone how they refine that over time. But but the, was the space shuttle ever designed for this? I'll get, I'll get to, I'll get to, so deep space, the, the relevance of getting to Earth orbit is our atmosphere. Yeah. If we did not have an atmosphere, if we were the moon, then one of the launch options is to go off like a, a rocket sled or a railgun into escape velocity. So you leave the launch facility at escape velocity and then use some sort of very gentle thrust over dozens of orbits. So the slingshot is not to get you into your final position, but it's to get you into an escape velocity so you can then start applying gentle thrust. You can't do that on Earth because of the atmosphere. Therefore, uh, getting above 60 kilometers, at least, and ideally 100, remains a really important piece of the puzzle. If we don't have a solution for that, then we do not have a solution for interplanetary, let alone interstellar. Um, and so, yeah, the Falcon 9 is this first demonstration of a vertical rocket that can land vertically, refuel, and, and launch again. Now, there's, a, there's cycling costs that'll come down, but yeah, the shuttle was built to assume that you'd sort of throw half the machine away. So that's a big step that you've got now a vertical vehicle that can in fact land vertical and cycle within, I forget the time, it's quick, it's a couple of weeks, uh, into another launch. Means that we, we get the cost of getting out of the atmosphere down drastically. So that sort of starts to rejig the economics for space at all. <coughs> yes, we'll stick initially to low Earth orbit. Musk wants to put, I forget the number, some very large number of, of, of communication satellites up to do blanket broadband from handheld devices. And so that's low Earth orbit. But 
it means clearing the atmosphere. It means solving that first really nasty problem. Um, getting to Mars, and let's as put human travel to one side. That adds a whole lot of other complications that we don't have good answers to. But, but dealing at the moment with robotic probes, the, the problem has always been, how do you, like, do you build, do you get, launch a bunch of things with fuel into low Earth orbit and then assemble in orbit? And that's sort of the, the space station program is, is part of that. Uh, do you do Mars Direct, the Zubrin model, which looks like a yes now? Um, do you do the, the orbital bus? This is Buzz Aldrin's design, which is um, pick a harmonic orbit that sort of fluctuates between Earth and Mars. So build a gigantic bus. And importantly, you have to put it up there once, but you don't have to keep relaunching it. This matters for human spaceflight because you need a, a very large bulk to protect from radiation. So build a gigantic bus that's passively sh shuttling between the orbits of Earth and Mars. Maybe very small amounts of thrust required. And then you're building a small craft to get to and from here, and a small craft to get to and from at the Mars end. The two, those two approaches, Mars Direct versus the bus, um, there's arguments both ways. Hello. How long would that bus typically take? Ah, so you're talking, uh, the, if you, conjunction, you're talking six months, opposition, you're talking 18. And so, yeah, it depends where the, meaning, conjunction meaning where Earth and Mars are at the time that you, so this is the sort of mission profile that, that NASA's been talking about forever. And it's, those are the, the sort of, unavoidable numbers if you're using chemical rockets. And so that's the second big change this year, is the paper that's just come out about the so far obviously impossible uh, EM drive, and yet uh, the researchers who came up with it have managed to get their paper through peer review. No one has reproduced it yet. And no one knows how on earth it works, earth or anywhere else. Uh, it seems obviously wrong. It's just a, a resonator with an EM field. <laughs> like, and yet somehow it's doing thrust. Like, uh, that, that shouldn't be possible. So, so, so let's assume for the sake of argument that somehow it does work, because there's a whole lot of stuff that we don't know about our universe, and I know this is a very convenient pretense. Um, assuming that it does, then that changes the economics and the physics and the engineering for getting to and from Mars. The same orbit can now be done in months, in like think 70 days, not 200. And so you, because you can continually apply thrust uh, through half of the, the transit and continually apply reverse thrust through the other half, rather than, being, rather than coasting most of the way. And so you're not carrying fuel. You're carrying these dodgy resonators. But they're, 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 they're much smaller and they're much lighter. And so, OK, how do you power it? Fine, you have a fuel cell or something. You've, there's a, there's, you still have to solve the problem of energy. Um, however, if you could hypothetically solve the problem of how to provide a continuous uh, electrical supply over centuries or millennia, then you're no longer talking how to get to Mars. You're talking about how to get to Proxima Centauri. So <laughs> in other developments last month, um, there's a property that's been observed for some time in synthetic diamonds. You put a synthetic diamond in a structure I don't yet understand in a, radio, in a field of alpha radiation, it generates a DC current. So OK, so far so good. Um, so if you were hypothetically to make the synthetic diamond out of carbon-14, which has about a 4,500 year half-life, then you've got something that is small, fairly robust, it's the hardest material known to mankind, it has no emissions, no radiation, requires no maintenance, it just delivers DC around the clock. Half-life of 5,000 years, it'll be at 10% of its initial capacity in 50,000 years' time. Give or take that, again, there are issues. You've got something that on the face of it looks like it could be a viable power supply to keep operating for very long periods of time. There's a bunch of other problems. We can't put human beings on it. We can't communicate. We haven't yet got technology that would work over the distances involved. Oh, but it is. Because of all the, graph because of all of the graphite moderated reactors. The UK alone is sitting on 140,000 tons of radioactive graphite. The surface of every single one. And that's, there's got to be stored. Carbon 14 is fairly. Uh, harmless. Yeah. A few centimeters of air is enough. But if it's in a powdered form, you can breathe it, then you don't have a few centimeters of air. So it's, 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 it's so 
widespread that it's used for carbon dating. It's the actual, and it's, it's slow, it's very long half-life is the basis of carbon dating. But if you've got 140,000 tons of carbon-14, or, or graphite rods, which are, whose outer surface is covered in carbon-14 because of bombardment of, of uh, alpha particles, then you've got to store the whole lot as though it was a hazardous radioactive waste, and you've got to do so for 50 to 100,000 years. So someone's gone, huh, well, it's only on the surface. So you've got your synthetic diamond machine, you've got your graphite rod, which is coated with, or whose surface is now carbon-14, just heat it. Vaporize the, the surface carbon, and what you're vaporizing is carbon-14. Run it through your synthetic diamond process, it, which works the same way for whichever, there may be minor differences in, in settings for, for the heavier isotope. You've now got a diamond made of carbon-14. So it's a, it's a standing source. You now cap it in carbon-12 diamond so that it doesn't emit harmful radiation. You've now got a diamond, which is a, a 50,000-year DC source. Now you have something that could theoretically power the currently theoretical and unproven EM drive. So it just, it just struck me like during the week that in the last month, like, whoa, two sort of game-changing ideas have appeared, one of which looked practical, one of which looks impossible, but has survived peer review. So that was really the, the observation, that these two things together for the first time give us what looks like a viable interstellar spacecraft. I haven't done the numbers, but, but different to Pioneer, uh, Voyager and is it Pioneer, the other ones, um, you'd have consistent thrust. And so yeah, the first century would be a bit slow. <laughs> but, but you know, it, it would continue. But it still doesn't solve the problem of radiation when you travel at the speed of light. Uh, so, so two things. One, I, I did set aside human uh, travel. Yeah. Getting human beings, human civilizations only exist. Well, it's necessary to human beings, but enough radiation to damage electronics. Sure. And so that's a set of problems that has to be solved. But the good news is that your power supply doesn't get harmed by radiation. It gets helped by it. It's a, it's a sort of, again, turn the radiation problem on its end. Fine, use synthetic diamonds that are arranged to turn radiation into a, a power source, and the more of it you get, the better you are. You've still got to shield your navigation control system, yes. How, how you run your oscillator and how you deal with steering, because once you've got thrust, you need steering. So, yeah, the, it, these are not solved. It just struck me as fascinating that we've got these two apparently fundamental innovations appearing in a, in a single month this year. So I was just curious, have you read anything on the economics of these diamonds? Like, you know, are these going to become household things? Or well, it depends things? on the application. Um, it's been pointed out that things like pacemakers, these would be a fantastic application. Because the, it's not that the battery is expensive, it's that the process of installation is expensive. <laughs> you know, cutting someone open is disruptive and costly so and dangerous. Yeah, who cares? Yeah. So, that, so for that sort of. The applications where. Um, Delivery is expensive, so getting a power source into low Earth orbit and above. Uh, where installation is expensive, surgical applications are obvious. Uh, there may be other IoT-like things where solar panels are impractical, uh, where you need a very small amount of power. Think um, all of the Sigfox stuff. Right? These are radio transmitters that live on one coin cell for five years. They, they demonstrate the existence of a market for uh, sensors that need very, very small amounts of power. But if you, if you sort of go up one step above that, OK, we can deliver 10 times as much power in a thing that will last the size of a small on a coin cell. It'll operate for the surface life of the device, and it leaves no, da no damaging waste, unlike a coin cell. So, so, I mean, putting aside the radiation problem, how do these compare with sort of the already used nuclear batteries that go into spacecraft? Uh, they're hard to make out of waste. Right, the graph, the, you know, how do you fund the use of the graphite? Well, currently the UK is incurring a massive cost right. in storing this stuff. So there's almost a, you know, please pay us to take it away. Right. <laughs> you know, find a way to turn it into, it doesn't, so, right. So fair question then is what happens to the, the graphite? If you take away 85% of the, 90% of the carbon-14 on the surface of the, the graphite rod, you still have a radiation problem, but it's a much cheaper one to store. You can't go and stick it in a, in a public tip, but you, the, costs, uh, the, the costs of failures are much lower, therefore the, the, the protective costs are much lower. Because it's much less dangerous. It's much less dangerous. Right. 
It's something that, for example, I don't know the numbers, but at some point you get to a, something that could safely enter a water stream, water system, could, could safely end up in a water stream, right, you, in small numbers. Whereas the current graphite, the store of graphite, if it does that, you've then got a sort of unusable water supply for years, decades, centuries, or longer. And so the, by taking the risks down, the, the, the protective costs come down. So there are direct ways to, to fund it in a way that doesn't apply to plutonium. I mean, plutonium is just nasty. It's, it's the common choice, right? You, you look at most spacecraft, they've got a black thing hanging out one side, most long, long range spacecraft, which contains a plutonium radioisotope generator. Uh, but you know, every time you put one of those in a spacecraft, in, in, a, in a rocket, you are risking catastrophe. And whereas if you've got carbon-14 diamonds, OK, it's, it's, it's a problem, but it's a much smaller one. So anyway, so what is that? Does that make sense? Are there other people who are interested in, I think, what, another 10 minutes? And I've lost my phone. Really? Oh, there it is. No? no. Thoughts, comments, counter arguments, Jeff? How are we doing with the construction of uh, space elevators? I haven't been paying close attention, that's, but that's a really good question because that's uh, the other way to get uh, cargo lifts. Yeah, you can't use it for human beings because of the Van Allen radiation belts. You, you'll spend two weeks, you, you'll be baked. But for cargo, uh, it's a significantly cheaper one. The problems there are recent work suggests that we can't produce the ribbon in a way that's robust. Okay. Its tensile strength is fantastic, but uh, it's uh, one nick and you, you know, there's no way to protect 35, 37,000 kilometers of ribbon. Oh, carbon nanotubes uh, established in a basically a tape. And whether it's this wide or this wide, I can't recall, but it's basically a, a long, thin tape that's uh, actually it's almost 40,000 kilometers long. So all the way to geostationary and then a bit further. And then you basically hang a sort of meteor at the other end. Um, so yeah, it's not the, t the tensile strength is fine, but the, to build a thing that's robust to, again, the atmosphere. You've got to survive birds, aircraft, terrorists, and just mechanical wear. Hey, it's a big deal. Have you read the Mars trilogy? That came out, right? They built space elevators to make the thing cheaper, and then you had terrorist activity, freedom fighter activity, um, where they caused the thing to come down. And so you get a, it's about the same as the diameter of the planet, as, as with Earth. And so you've got a thing landing at several hundred times the speed of sound. Yeah, the, the devastation is horrific. And so the same thing applies to a, a terrestrial one. Carbon down there, let's say if a catastrophic failure, how are you going to disassemble them? I think the problem if you have a catastrophic failure is that you're not going to disassemble it. It's going to disassemble for yourself. It's going to disassemble for you, and it's going to land okay. somewhere. Probably, mean, probably on Singapore, of course. The likely place for, a, for a, yeah. a, a ligature that way to hit the ground is the equator. Well, we're not that far from it. Uh, just one degrees, I know. We're, you know we're, we're within range of... And even if not, you know, suddenly you get a tsunami in the strait, right? So it's a, yeah, don't know. I, work continues, but uh, the, the answer at the moment appears to be there's no way to protect the, the thing from operational use. Yes, we can build the, the tensile strength is fine, but a, a viable cable, no. This is kind of probably a new question, but why don't we have a, a man based on the moon yet? Why bother? That's actually the external environment uh, has limited resource capability. Right? You can't, the near in colonization project only worked because there were resources made available by it, and the same would apply to the moon or Mars or all the other which are three of these candidates. Um, and in each case, the answer is is there any hope of some sort of economic return? And this, this applies even if you don't believe in capitalism. Even as nation states, there's got to be a return. It's got to be a bit of security. There's got to be a way to, to cover the resources that were uh, invested. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. So in Mars' case, um, I, th so I think in Mars' case, there's a couple of things. One, there are resource options, although it's not clear that it's cheap. The asteroids are a better bet because you don't have to get your resources out of gravity well. Anything you're trying to bring from Mars to Earth, it's a rather expensive proposition. So unless they sort of find you know, diamonds the size of buses <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and want to bring those back. It's we did discover an entire planet made out of diamonds. 
I have no doubt that there are options of many of all those kinds, but that, that's now interstellar. That's not sort of solar system. Um, I think that the, the argument for Mars actually is um, both the sort of scientific and engineering byproducts as with the, the moon race, but also what we get to learn about uh, ecosystem engineering, which for the reasons we were just discussing, I now believe is inevitable. I don't think, we, I don't think it's possible now for, to avoid geoengineering. To avoid, what, to avoid geoengineering. And so, you know, it would be nice to have a, an environment where we can experiment without putting the entire species at risk. Now, that's, that problem is centuries away, but the whole thing, this, this takes time. And so starting down that path uh, improves our ability to build and control living environments for human beings and what human beings depend upon uh, and in ways that are not sort of happening inside our own biosphere. So they're, they're fake. If you look at the uh, biosphere project in the 70s or 80s, um, yeah, like the thing got invaded. You put a bunch of scientists in a closed system for two years, well, that's great, except that you know, the concrete was leaching, uh, or cement in the concrete was leaching into the system yeah, and poisoning it. Yeah. So they had to pump oxygen in to prevent the crew from dying. And, <coughs> and then they had a political problem, and so someone actually broke into the facility. So I mean, you know, none of, when, when you've got actual human beings actually in transit to Mars or living on Mars, all that sort of fake test goes away, and you're now dealing for real. You build a system that works, or, or your crew dies. And so what we learn doing that, we, we can't learn any other way. And so it's valuable from that perspective and then longer term it gives us a, a control a, a control environment to, to experiment in ways that we can't afford to experiment on earth so I those are the arguments how we generate how we turn that into returns that governments will invest in your earlier question governments or corporations it's less obvious but uh, Musk can see it as essential if anyone can work it out he's likely others stun silence any, does, does this make sense? Am I completely off my rocker? Having a base at the moon? I don't see. I don't see. I don't see the point. Oh, you don't see the point? Um, it doesn't give us. It gives us some of the, the benefit in terms of learning about a biosphere, or learning about how to control rather a, an environment for human beings. It doesn't give us over a long enough period. It doesn't give us a control environment to test experiment to experiment on in the way we we can't experiment on the moon's atmosphere because it hasn't got one. <laughs> Mars is a bit small but it's got one. Um, the resource exploitation maybe but I you know a base for the base's sake I don't think has the, the same strengths. Yes if someone determines that there's a resource reason for doing so then it's much cheaper to get stuff off the surface of the moon and into trans-earth orbit because you just do it with a gun a, a, like a rail gun just and you, you meaning you get it not into merely lunar escape orbit lunar escape velocity, but also into trans-Earth. So you don't even need a, a propulsion system. You just fire it and then recover it in Earth orbit. If, if someone finds resources that are worth recovering at that expense, which it's expensive, <laughs> but maybe. But, I, but as a, uh, because it's there, I think it's, I, I may be wrong. I, I, it feels like too simple. Like, yeah, we've cleared level one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Is it necessary to build a base there before we do a Martian base? I'm not convinced. I, I think Mars is a better bet because it has uh, an atmosphere, gravity that human beings are better suited to, um, the appearance of more resources, uh, and importantly, the ability to, to manufacture the fuel for, the, for return journeys, which the moon doesn't obviously have. And so it, it means that on a single mission basis, the costs are obviously higher. On a sort of 10, 20, or 100 mission program, the costs are potentially lower for Mars than for the Moon. So this is a you know, somewhat important option. The asteroid mining thing mixed. I, it feels like a science project. On the other hand, I mean, there's asteroids made of metals that are really, really valuable on Earth. So maybe, but I, I don't know. I don't know how you prospect at an industrial scale in asteroids you've got to fly in a spacecraft. Maybe a thousand years. Uh, given time, yes. And so it's, the question is, you know, this century, really, if, and ideally this generation, but how to, how, where are the incentives to start? And what, what can be achieved that's worthwhile, at least within a human lifetime? Right? We, we, planning on a scale beyond that is, is somewhere between impossible and delusional. So I, yeah, Mars looks the better option. Right. Cool. I, anyway.
No other questions, comments, thoughts? Thank God we get to end early. One pose. Huh? One pose. <laughs> not yet willing to embrace sci-fi. At least not that way. Uh, uh, yeah, OK, so the similarity of the title, this was about travel, not about the movie. Um, yeah, what will we discover? I don't know. But I is it? I remember a few years ago somebody managed to teleport a single photon. That's a, that's a long way off. Yeah, and so even that, there's argument about what they did or didn't achieve because you're now making specific assumptions about uh, the nature of matter in interpreting the experiment. And the experiment doesn't allow us to determine the correctness of one interpretation over another. So you're it's like, yes, probably they did. Under one interpretation, they did, yes. But is that, you know, does it allow us to move a, an apple or per Star Trek, a puppy, uh, from you know, one, one side of the room to another? It, it was a corgi. <laughs> right? I mean, you know. Um, these are research areas, and I, I would suggest that as part of understanding fundamental physics, that research should continue. But it doesn't, um, I don't think, has foreseeable impact. That's not to say it won't have. But it means that it's it's so remote that I, you know, I can't point at a plausible path. So that's the, I guess. Cool. All right. Well, thank you for your attention. It's five minutes anyway. Fine.